I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation uh, on standard and transmission-based infection control protocols. This is the first in a series of discussions on um, protection of healthcare workers and public health professionals uh, in the course of their routine uh, duties and uh, is part of the infectious disease response training um, uh, put on in cooperation uh, with Emory University. Uh, I'm Dr. Paul McKinney, University of Louisville, and I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Alex Isakoff, who uh, helped develop this uh, slide set and uh, who uh, kindly uh, allowed us to use uh, it in the construction of our coursework as well in collaboration uh, with him. Dr. Isakoff is from the section of Pre-Hospital and Disaster Medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine at Emory University in Atlanta. So in discussing standard precautions, uh, which is the basis of all infection control uh, protocol that might be uh, um, uh, utilized in a, in a uh, routine fashion in a healthcare setting, um, that term combines what used to be known as universal precautions and body substance isolation. Universal precautions applies to uh, blood and a variety of other body fluids and body substance isolation uh, was designed to reduce the risk of transmission from a whole variety of moist body substances. So utilizing both of those together, we have the term now standard precautions. And standard precautions does apply to, you know, in particular, blood, but also all other body fluids, generally except uh, sweat. It applies to situations that might involve exposure of non-intact skin, and especially mucous membranes, which are uh, otherwise vulnerable points of entry for viruses, uh, bacteria, and other pathogens. Standard precautions are designed to reduce the risk of transmission from both recognized and unrecognized sources, and that's really key in this entire concept, because one never knows when uh, an individual might be harboring a pathogen that is unrecognized, uh, or if one is suspected to be infected, one doesn't know necessarily what the virulence of that might be. So uh, using standard precautions does serve to protect the healthcare worker or, or public health professional against a whole variety of unsuspected exposures. Standard precautions does involve a variety of techniques. First and foremost, hand washing, which can be overlooked because it uh, is such a mundane and seemingly routine technique that it uh, can be undervalued, but still uh, is one of the foundational uh, approaches to standard precautions. The use of gloves uh, when uh, one might be contacting uh, oozing uh, or, or bloody surfaces on uh, a patient's skin uh, or mucous membranes. Uh, the use of masks for protection of the uh, mouth and nose and eye protection, uh, which might include uh, goggles or uh, a face shield to prevent uh, splashes uh, into the ocular mucous membranes. A gown is important for um, the protection of uh, skin surfaces and also clothing that it might otherwise be soiled with blood or body fluids. Uh, it also entails uh, protection of patient care equipment, um, use of uh, appropriate environmental controls, which we'll discuss, um, uh, taking care of the appropriate treatment of linens, and uh, in the occupational health setting, uh, certainly involves uh, appropriate needle handling to prevent the, the possibility of needle sticks. And, and additionally, uh, can entail things like patient placement that helps to uh, prevent the likelihood of disease transmission. Looking at hand washing, um, again, uh, a procedure so simple and yet uh, so important for uh, elimination or, or, or reduction in the uh, likelihood of, of pathogenic uh, bacteria or virus transmission. Um, Hand washing uh, should be done with copious amounts of uh, soap and water, 
and uh, should last uh, generally at least about uh, 20 seconds. Uh, people have uh, devised different ways of doing that count, uh, suggesting that you silently uh, sing to yourself, row, row, row your boat, uh, uh, all the way through twice, and that will be approximately 20 seconds uh, to assure that you've done this uh, completely, covering all uh, skin surfaces there, uh, covering the uh, uh, nails and uh, scrubbing up and, and rinsing thoroughly afterwards. Uh, despite the importance that had been recognized for a long time of hand hygiene, uh, the adherence to this protocol in hospitals is quite variable. Uh, a number of reports in the literature show uh, adherence rates which are clearly below that which would be uh, desired. But uh, if anything, the uh, overall trend from 1994 uh, through 2000 in this series of reports is at least generally increasing. Um, 1994, the level was 29% in uh, general uh, units and intensive care units, uh, and uh, by the year 2000, up to around 48%, which is still, of course, less than half and uh, far below an optimal range. Uh, but at least the word is uh, partially uh, being uh, transmitted, understood, and resulting in appropriate changes uh, in practice. Self-reported factors for poor adherence uh, with hand hygiene, that is reasons why people uh, are not using uh, soap and water routinely uh, or other uh, agents for uh, decontamination of skin surfaces are that those agents can cause irritation and dryness. Uh, and of course this is true. Uh, one has to be aware of that and uh, you know, appropriate use of uh, moisturizers uh, uh, after patient care encounters may be uh, important to prevent dryness and, and cracking of the skin. Uh, they also include the fact that sinks can be inconveniently located uh, and that there may be a lack of, of, of sinks or poor placement of sinks that don't facilitate hand washing. And this of course is true. Uh, the situation is not perfect in every patient care setting, but uh, one must still uh, work with what is available and uh, and do uh, the best possible under those circumstances to make sure that hygiene occurs routinely. Sometimes there's a lack of soap or paper towels for drying. Um, and one has probably encountered all of these uh, if you've been around in the healthcare setting long enough. People say they're too busy or there's insufficient time, but of course the, uh, the time spent, the 20 seconds or so spent in Hand hygiene uh, in between patients is an excellent investment. Sometimes there's understaffing, overcrowding, uh, and that may, may make it more difficult to, uh, to deal with appropriate hand washing. Occasionally, we hear that patient needs take priority, that there's an, an acute situation. There's not, not time for hand washing, but again, um, it's rare that uh, 20 seconds would not be um, uh, uh, wisely invested uh, in such situations. And we also hear that there's a low risk or perceived low risk of acquiring infection from patients. And while this might be true um, uh, broadly in, uh, in certain low risk situations, uh, in, in certain types of hospitals, it is not true uh, in uh, secondary and tertiary care hospitals uh, where people of all sorts of um, risk backgrounds in terms of uh, infection likelihood uh, are present and uh, this is not a good uh, general approach to use uh, and uh, does not justify uh, an absence of hand washing. And uh, looking at the different kinds of agents that might be used to help reduce bacteria on the hands, this graph is uh, very useful. Uh, the orange lines uh, plot the uh, persistence of bacteria relative to the original um, uh, number that were present, arbitrarily set here as 100%, and looking at the time after disinfection uh, from 0 to 180 minutes, which is, of course, three hours. <clears throat> if you'll notice, uh, uh, plain soap has a, a reasonable uh, reduction in um, 
bacteria. Uh, antimicrobial soap does better, uh, measured as 4% chlorhexidine. But uh, the best of these three is an alcohol-based hand rub with 70% uh, uh, isopropyl alcohol, which um, results in a uh, too long or better reduction uh, in uh, bacterial counts and persistence uh, of that um, uh, for uh, a period of time afterwards. So one will notice if using an alcohol-based rub that the uh, aroma of that alcohol will persist for a period of time afterwards, indicating uh, residual protection uh, against transmission. Uh, on the next uh, module, we'll discuss uh, transmission-based uh, protocols for infection control, beginning with contact precautions.